So let's just talk about some imaging basics, and maybe this will be good to get through tonight if I can, to just get through contrast, resolution, and noise, and then we'll pick up um, with the next part of this um, on our, our next talk. So contrast is what really allows us to perceive something in the image. I mean, it allows us to, to see on the film or the, the packs two di areas as being different in the image. In medical imaging, we're really concerned with three types, object contrast, subject, an image or detector contrast, if you will. So, so what is contrast? Well, well, mathematically, if you think about one region of the image versus a background of the image, it's really talking about, you know, what's the difference in intensity values in those, re those regions? Um, and there are a number of different formulas for doing it. If you looked at kind of what's the Hounsfield units in one area versus a background on a CT or the brightness on an X-ray um, th that you could use uh, a measure like this. On MR, what's the signal intensity in one area versus the background area divided by the intensity in that uh, uh, area you're interested in? Or in nuclear medicine imaging, how much um, activity are you measuring in one area versus a background area divided by that uh, uh, area there? So it's kind of a normalized to that, that location there. But, you know, conceptually, this is what I want you to understand, right? This is a high contrast image where there's a, a big difference between the area of interest and the background. And this is a low contrast image, whether this is a radiograph, whether this is an MR, whether this is a nuclear medicine study. What is object contrast? Well, object contrast really has to do with um, the, a property of the thing that we're imaging. You know, is there enough difference in linear attenuation in the object itself in two regions? If there isn't, we, we have no hope to make an image of it that looks different, right? If there's no difference in linear attenuation in two regions in the image, we're not going to be able to sh have that show up on an X-ray or in CT. Maybe we would on MR because maybe there is a difference in the density of protons in that area right kind of thing so so in MR you know maybe it's proton density in PET it's the uh, amount of uptake of a particular radio tracer in those those tissues if two regions have the same object contrast we can't hope to make an image of them so we've got to have object contrast and I want to give an example here here's bone muscle water and air and I've just put their physical density here so I'm, I'm being a real troublemaker right I spent 15 20 minutes trying to explain to you what linear attenuation was and that it isn't exactly the same as physical density and now I'm showing you physical density and showing this but they're closely related to each other but if I was being more precise I should really have put linear attenuation numbers here. Notice there's quite a big difference between bone and muscle, but muscle and water are very similar, and, but they're quite different from air. So there's really good object contrast here. So what about subject contrast? Well, now we're going to irradiate that object, or, or now after we uh, stimulate that object with our uh, MR uh, coils, we're going to listen to the signal from it. And how much signal is produced by those tissues? Or how much do those tissues attenuate the x-ray beam? And the subject contrast is really a measure of that, right? So here's those same tissues. And we've now irradiated it with a polychromatic x-ray beam, KVP equal to 30. And here's the percentage of the x-rays that would make it through one centimeter of bone, muscle, water, and air. And notice the difference here, 0.66 and 0.68, these are still very close to each other, right? Still very close to each other. But what if I do that at 100 kVp? Well, remember, these tissues, 100 kVp x-rays, this x-ray beam is going to be higher energy when we apply 100 kVp across the tube than down at, at 60. And so these are going to penetrate those tissues better. So now the difference here, 0.83 and 0.84, only one part difference between those. So the contrast has been reduced by increasing that KVP, right? As a matter of fact, if we went even higher, the amount through muscle and water would be basically identical. We would have no hope to differentiate them. This is the subject contrast, okay? 
And then the next thing is the image contrast, because now I have to stop those things and detect them. Or in the MR example, I have to detect that signal intensity that's coming out of the tissue and measure it. And that may result in some degradation um, in that information as well. And that's the imaging contrast. Is there enough difference left that I can make an image out of that? Now, in the screen film imaging days, by the way, anyone in the room still use film for anything. In 2015, I think 5% of the country was still doing skill, screen film mammography. My, my guess is no, no one's going to raise their hand um, and say that they're using any screen film for anything right now. Yes? Someone? Okay. So still some people are, right? In digital imaging, I can leave the development of the image out of the chair, right? With a piece of film, you can underdevelop it or overdevelop it. You could overexpose it or underexpose it, and that contributes a tremendous amount to the imaging chain, right? In digital imaging, we're much luckier. So remember that equation that I showed you? In digital imaging, when the tech is preparing your image for you, they actually subtract this arbitrary constant from pixel value here in the background and then again here. And if you'll notice these k's will cancel each other. And so notice now you end up with this equation for contrast that has this constant k in it. And if you wanted to, you could make this k very close to PA. As a matter of fact, make it much closer to PA than PA is to PB. And this number becomes very large. Digital imaging, by adjusting that k factor, you can really work over an extremely wide range of contrast with digital images. That was basically impossible to do with screen film imaging. So we don't really use the idea of contrast as much when we talk about digital imaging because digital imaging is not contrast limited. Instead, we use this contrast to noise ratio because if you make that K very close to PA, so that you get your contrast to be what you want to be. It extenuates the noise in the image. That's the problem that occurs when you, when you do that. And so digital imaging tends to be noise uh, image. So this contrast to noise ratio is the difference between the property at pixel A and the background divided by the noise in the image. And I, so I just wanted to say that it's a little bit different in digital. But conceptually, we all have a really good idea of what a low contrast versus a high contrast image. And, one of the nice things is, at the PACs, we can adjust the contrast as well. We can't adjust it to the same degree that the tech could by changing that constant K. Remember, that's something that the tech did before they sent the image to you. If you ever have an image and you can't see a particular area well, ask your tech to go back and reprocess it and they'll adjust the K, let them know the part of the image that you want to try to see the best, and they'll choose a K that be gives you better contrast in that region. Okay? The only downside is the image might get quite noisy in that region. So next thing, we just finished talking about contrast, and next I wanted to talk about spatial resolution. When we talk about resolution, we're really talking about how much can we differentiate between two subtle things. Um, so we, we actually can talk about contrast resolution, which is what we talked about last time, and now specifically when I say resolution, I'm talking about spatial resolution. And that's the notion of, you know, how small can objects get and I can still see them, but another way to think about it is how close together can small objects get and I can still distinguish them as being separate from each other. And that's this idea of these line pair phantoms that you see a lot in radiology try to capture. If I take one of these and I image them with an imaging system, how well can I separate these as individual lines? And if you had an ideal system and you image one of these, an x-ray system, well then if you measured the brightness across across the surface of the film. It should be at a perfectly high level at one spot and down at the lowest level. And this should really be a rectangular function if we took a profile across the image. But in truth, we get some blurring at the edges with any system. So maybe a good system would round those edges off a little bit, and a poor system would really kind of blur those bars into each other quite a bit. 
And it turns out that most systems, as you try to drive to higher and higher resolution, in other words, if you take a look at more line pairs per millimeter, you go from a very good fidelity uh, resolution properties to, to much poorer properties. And every system has some limiting resolution where basically this looks like a flat line. When you take an image of that phantom with very high number of line pairs per millimeter, it just looks like it's uniformly gray, if you will. And that notion, if you'll take the height of these curves for each of these line pairs, so here's six pairs, here's eight pairs, I think this is uh, uh, 16 pairs or so, if we'll, we'll go ahead and plot those, here's the red, here's the blue, the 16, we're plotting the height of the curve from here to here, in the purple one from here to here, the height of the curve versus the number of line pairs, we see that that drops off, that hot height drops off. And this is referred to as the modulation transfer function. And the nice thing about this is, if I know what the modulation transfer function is for my x-ray tube, because it has a, a certain focal spot size and therefore has a limiting resolution, and I know what the resolution properties of my detector are, because it doesn't have perfect resolution properties, I can multiply the two MTFs together and it'll give me the resolution properties of my overall system. In looking at this, just keep in mind what a really good system should do, right? A really good system should be flat way out here, even up to very high frequencies, right? No matter how many line pairs per millimeter you get, you still get very close to 100% of that true height. So with the MTF, the flatter that looks across, the better the resolution properties. The next thing I wanted to talk about was noise. Okay, so noise is that random fluctuation in the image uh, intensity about its true value. Uh, and quantum model is due solely to statistical variation. Sometimes the x-ray makes it through, sometimes it doesn't make it through. And we, it, um, whether it does or not is determined probabilistically. And it's, quantum model is the most important source of noise in our imaging. It turns out that the probability, the statistics that govern whether an x-ray makes it through an object or not is, is governed by something called the Poisson distribution. And that's very nicely approximated by the Gaussian or the normal curve, the bell curve, once we get up above a mean of about 10. And certainly most of our x-ray images have more than 10 x-rays per pixel, so that approximation suffices. Um, it has a mean of n and a standard deviation of square root of n. So what's interesting for these statistics is that really if you tell me the average number of x-rays that ended a particular picture, that would tell me both the mean as well as the standard deviation because the standard deviation is just given by the square root of n. So noise is perceived by us. When we look at the image, noise is perceived by us as something called the coefficient of variation, or if you will, the relative noise. You know, if, if there were a lot of x-rays, um, we, we perceive the noise differently when they're very few. And, and so let's take a look at this. Right here, if we had 10 photons per pixel, if we take the square root of that, which was the noise as we talked about, that's 3.2. Now if we go up to 10,000, the square root of that is 100. So this is, 100 is quite a bit bigger than the 3.2, but our eye perceives what we call the relative noise, which is this noise number divided by the number of uh, photons n. So this 100, right, divided by um, the number of, the square root of those, that number, sorry, that um, noise divided by those number of pixels. So here that is expe expressed as a percentage. So 100 divided by 10,000 times 100 to get in a percentage. The relative noise here is 1% compared to the relative noise down here, which is 32%. So that's the, the number that we perceive when we visually look at the image. Just as an example, here's a, a phantom of a pelvis radiograph obtained with two milliamp seconds, so current, right, times the time, and here at 160, right, so 80 times um, more MAS. And you can see the speckling here compared to here. 
Here's a contrast versus resolution versus noise, right? We're now putting all of those three things together. Notice we've got some different size discs, right? And they're in a background setting of some noise. And there's a row of them which are higher contrast than the, I'm sorry, a column of them, which are higher contrast than the next column and the next column. And you can get, really get a feeling for how both contrast and spatial resolution in conjunction with noise play a role in how conspicuous a lesion is to us. There's an interplay between all of those quantities.